it's awfully nice that you've joined us today, or it's our community, because it's so fun to meet all of our neighbors. And this one is a really close neighbor. His name is Miguel M. Morales. And he is um, he's a writer, a poet, uh, an activist, <laughs> and he works in the library at Johnson County Community yeah, College. Yeah. That's, that's, to put food, <laughs> that's to put food on the table yeah. again. Exactly. Yes, yes. Yeah. And he is a really interesting guy. He grew up in Texas working as a migrant and a seasonal farm worker. That ain't easy. No, it's really hard work. I, I um, started working as a child as a migrant farm worker. So when I first started, it was fun being out in the fields and running around. But then I realized, oh, it's a job, and you have to put on clothes so you don't get sunburned, and it was really difficult. And you don't and get much money. You do not get much money. And when you're a child, you earn even less than an adult, an adult does. Doing the same work. Doing the same work. Did you, were your parents farm workers? Too? Uh, my parents were farm workers. And my, um, the, like the year that I became full-time in farm work, uh, my dad got a job in a meatpacking factory. So he made more money. So he made more money, and we got benefits, and that eventually was able to move us out of from farm work into a larger city. But when he was in the working meatpacking, my mom became like the crew chief. And almost all of our the farm worker crew were women, and it was me. And so guys would come and they would say, oh, if women can do it, then I can do it too. And they wouldn't last one day. They would come in the morning and that by noon they wanted to go home. And my mom would say, you can go sit in the station wagon, but we're going to finish the job. And sometimes they would and they would get half a day pay and we'd work through it. Because there the was week. a tough, <laughs> tough old lady. A tough woman and farm work is a hard job and women do the hardest jobs that there are. Are you the only child in your family? To no, get I have three older sisters, so I knew farm work from them, and I knew that it was hard but work from them. Do they have an education as good as yours? Oh yeah, they they are so much smarter than I am, and so much more accomplished. I. Uh, well, what they do you think off. it was that um, promoted them into the thought that they needed to do that? I think at that time and this was too. in the, yeah this was in the seventies early eighties, and I just think. They thought this could be my life. This could be my whole path in life. Just farm Picking work, things and living in a small mm. town in Texas, and that's it. That's that's it. And so, you know, when they were old enough to get jobs in fast food, then they did that, and then they moved to department stores and just whatever experience they could get, they did. And then finally, each one of them said, "I'm going to create my own business." And they're business owners and really successful. I, I you know everything I know about being a professional comes from them because they're just so but much smarter was, than I am. But it was not your parents that pushed. No, my parents were, my, my mother had an eighth grade education and my father, um, he just barely finished high school. Um, so to them, their jobs were to just make sure the family had food on the table. Yeah. And whenever we well, that's had... that's about all they could do. That's really, yeah, that's really all you could do. And because their, my father's parents were sharecroppers and my mother's parents uh, were immigrants. So... The drive really wasn't to like create a future. It was like stabilize the present, leave the yeah. But stabilizing the present gave you the yeah. platform on which to stand exactly to move forward. Yeah. They didn't realize that. Yeah, no, no, they didn't. They... And I know sometimes they felt really guilty that they couldn't help us with homework or select courses for school. But then that's when I was at least fortunate to be able to rely on my sisters to how to navigate high school and choosing courses and things like that. And unfortunately, they kind of had to figure that stuff out on their own. But your parents must be very proud of their four children. Well, yeah. My, my, unfortunately, my mom passed away about 20 years ago. But um, she lived long enough to see the children. Yes, yeah. She lived, lived long enough to see everybody kind of find their path and, and do well and to see her first, her first grandchild. So, yeah, she was, she was good. And, of course, my dad, he's still alive and he's... Directing things. Yeah, he's happy. <laughs> that's my kid. That's my daughter. That's my I'm like dad. See, and see, that, that's so nice. <laughs> yeah, it's a great reward. Yeah. Well, and in your behalf, you decided at some point mm. you wanted to be a writer. What moved you to do that when you needed to make a living? <laughs> yeah, well, <laughs> I mean, I you to... know, I think well, at least in my case, writing was always something I could do. I could always tell a good story. I could always find out what a good story was, but. Um, there's the kind of this thing, and I don't know if it's in a lot of other communities, but it's in the Hispanic community that whatever skill you have should be monetized, and that's you can make money off of that. So if somebody can sew, then they end up sewing and making money off that. If you can cook, then you cook for money. 
and I could write, but I didn't want that to be turned into some a job because then all those people who I knew loved cooking or sewing, they kind of ended up resenting that they had to well, they use that tired. for. Yeah. yeah, and so I didn't want to like sully or spoil that my love for writing. So I hid it for a really long time until I um, until actually till my mom passed away, and I just needed to find a way to like get all the words out of me. And I took a class here at Johnson County Community College. It was a comp one English class. And uh, Judy Oden, I remember she was my comp teacher. She was tough, but she she got it out of me. She gave me the the tools to be able to put it on paper. And that was the, the beginning. Well, but see, that's the greatest gift she could have <laughs> given. That's yeah, the greatest yeah. gift she could have given. Yeah. So you are a member of um, the... Um, Lambda Literary Society. Yes. And this is kind of an interesting mission that they have. Mm -hmm. It nurtures and advocates for LGBTQ writers. Yes. Elevating the impact of their words to create community, preserve our legacies, and affirm the value of our stories. Yes. Yeah, I, w I was very fortunate to meet, um, at the time, the director, his name was Tony Valenzuela, and uh, I had never seen another... Latino uh, queer man who was the head of a kind of any organization. So when I met him, I just really zeroed in and just wanted to know everything about him. And he said, we have this program called the Lambda Literary Fellows, and we bring people in from all across the country, actually all across the world. And they meet for a week in Los Angeles, and they write, and they uh, just share, and we share our experience, and we learn craft from other writers who are mentors. It was a really great experience. It really pushed me along the road to think, maybe this is something that is beyond a hobby. Maybe it's a different tool than just putting my words on paper and keeping them out there. I, I found out maybe, let me submit a couple of things to a journal here or there or to an anthology and see what happens. They kind of gave me the confidence to put my work out in a professional manner. So, you know, think people you meet, it can be kind of push you along the road. And you're always, you know, grateful to having met them. And well, and and you also are a member of the Macondo Writers Workshop. Yes, Sandra Cisneros uh, started that workshop, and it's in Texas. And uh, wow, that's just a really great program. So many writers throughout the years have been part of this this uh, program. And again, it's another uh, week long. Uh, I think it's a half a week retreat where you come and you meet. Uh, you're in a cohort, a poetry cohort, or a fiction cohort. And you just share your stories, or you say, I'm having, this is the work in progress that I'm having, and it's, there's like a, an obstacle that I just can't seem to get over. A writer's block. Yeah, that's what it is, or yeah. your characters aren't cooperating yeah. the way you want them to. And they just basically, like, they give you tools, and, but most of the time they say, just get out of your own way. These are ways that you can kind of release some of that control that you want to have over these characters or, these, or your writing, and you just let it flow and find a way to... Uh, like in life, deal with the circumstances. Is most of what you write poetry? Everything comes to me as a poem at first because it's so concise and, you know, just easy to but get on paper. It forces you to be concise. Yeah, it does. It does. Rambling and it makes doesn't you, work. <laughs> no. And there's a beginning, a middle, and an end to a poem. But then sometimes I'll look at a piece and I think, maybe this should be a short story. Or maybe this should be an essay. And actually one piece that I wrote, one of my first pieces, uh, was a, a poem about my mother being a me and them being farm workers, and I wrote it for this young farm worker group. And then I expanded it into a short story that was published in an anthology. And then uh, somebody at UMKC said, they're looking, uh, this class is looking for to marry visual art and poetry. So then uh, this young artist selected my work and he turned it into a painting. And then okay. I submitted it to this other contest and this uh, fall it's being turn turned into an animated a short film for about five minutes long. I think that's wonderful, yeah. but I think that you need to hear one of Miguel's poems. <laughs> this one I particularly oh, like, so yeah. I, I took uh, the uh, making the decision okay. here <laughs> okay. to the cider. So this is Unintentional Rainbows. Hmm. Ever since I woke up this morning, I've been seeing unintentional rainbows. The seats on the bus with curving multicolored lines in the fabric reveal a cascading array of rainbow figures, endlessly jumping and dancing through the sunlight. In the library, art students file past, 
my desk moving toward a table in the back. They spread out colored pencils, sharp tips, reproduced deconstructed, rain deconstructed rainbows, I love that, mm -hmm. on sketch pads. A small black girl in the grocery store, her hair separated with vibrant, elastic hair bands, pulls her mother to the display of fruits and berries, a kaleidoscope of colors. Sitting in the kitchen listening to a report marking one year since the Pulse shooting, I finally let my tears flow as a luminous sunset gifts me another rainbow. So in the rainbow, there is indeed sadness, too. There is. Um, you know, the, the rainbow um, flag represents the diversity within the LGBTQ community. Um, and I, you know, there's been a lot of tragedy in the community in, in the past, especially during the HIV AIDS crisis. Let's we talk lost about so that many a bit, because people. Because yeah. I'm older than you are. I lived through that. And yeah. we lost not one, but several generations of yes. very talented men and a few women, but mostly yeah, men. Exactly, and, and that's, what I, that's what I'm really trying to go back into now. I, I was a member of a group called ACT UP, which was a, a group of I AIDS activists. Act yeah, I was, I was there. We were at City Hall trying to get the, 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 the human rights ordinance to have inclusion for LGBT people to have safe housing and people with HIV to have safe housing. Um, and I remember those days, and, and unfortunately, when I, when you think of those days, so many people passed away, so many friends, so many people and that you love. And very difficult passing. Very difficult passing. You know, sometimes it was very, sometimes it was suicide, sometimes it was just the heart ravage of the disease, sometimes, you know, people were just cruel and mean. Um, and so there's part of you that just wants to lock that away and say, I don't want to think about that time anymore, but it's really a disservice to all those people that you knew and you loved. But I gotta ask you, what in the world possessed you? Uh, you are a man of color, already a minority. Mm -hmm. What possessed you to step out and put your personal safety on the mm -hmm. line here? What what came over you? Well <laughs> as I a, as your mother might say. <laughs> yeah, really my mom was like, I don't I don't understand you. But um I think that my family has always been very activist in social justice. Um, in farm work and my dad was in the labor movement and so I just thought that this is the right thing to do I have to speak up and I have to say things but then also I was at a young that young age where you know when there's a certain age where you just have a lot of rage in you and it could either go bad or it can go somewhere else and I just took all that rage and my frustration with society and the world and myself and I channeled it into activism something positive yeah so I mean anger is a tool and you can use it to knock somebody on the head like a hammer or you can use it to build a house and so I took my anger and I turned it into a hammer to build a house and knock a few people in the head. but but, but yeah. you know you um, you were willing to stand up yeah. for who you are yeah. and what you believe so many people yeah. are not willing to do what I, I mean yeah, I don't. I mean, I think there's there's a line in each person that says, "I can't live one more day like this, and if no one's going to do something, then I have to do it." To me, that's what a leader is. A leader is somebody who says, "I just have to do it. I can't be silent anymore. I have to do something." Um, and I'm seeing a lot of young people take that spirit now, which is very. Uh, it makes me so happy because for a while there was a generation, like half a generation, that just was very. Um, kind of wrapped in themselves, which is what you do when you're young. But now we've got, you know, the Parkland students and the DACA students. Everybody, uh, there's the a young, young they're generation. Getting younger. They're getting, they're getting younger they're and they're being more active in the world. And that just makes me really happy to see that. But also to see some of the older generation still remember World War II or remember, you know, the, the struggles that the United States faced. And now they're kind of remembering that time, so activism doesn't have an age limit. You can be young, you can be old, you could be in the middle like me, and just do what you can. Well, there's a picture of you that I pulled <laughs> off of the internet, and it says you are you say the church has blood on its hands, everyone aids death every seven minutes. Um, and underneath it, it says, giving my mom a reason to pray the rosary. <laughs> and I'm yeah. sure she worried about you. She did. She worried a lot. She uh, At that time, she had breast cancer, and she was just like, Mijo, why do you have to go and do that? You know, why can't you stay here with me? She was afraid I'm kill you. Yeah, well, she was afraid that there was a lot of police brutality and people just didn't understand. And um, 
But I think when she um, had cancer her, uh, and had surgery, I think after that she realized he's not just doing this for people with AIDS. He's doing this for people who don't have access to health care, who need medication, and that's me. So then she realized she had a lot in common with people with AIDS because her immune system was compromised because of cancer and radiation and chemo and all yeah. those things. So, Well, yeah. this is what you wrote at that time. We were in the streets in the local government offices fighting against city ordinances. We were in the state houses fighting legislation. When businesses, both small and corporate, wanted to fire people with AIDS, we fought back. When the American Medical Association wanted to institute mandatory HIV testing for anyone seeking medical treatment, we fought them and we won. Um, I think that, and it says, um, Reagan was an advocate, and Nancy Reagan, you mm -hmm. speak very highly, you said Hillary Clinton changed her mind. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and I think that um, what you and others did in the cause of the LGBT community, and that was what it called at that time, yeah. and we have added the Q. Q on and the there's end. more letters. <laughs> yeah, but I can't yeah. remember. All. Yeah. But um, I think what you did and how you put your personal safety on the line did make a difference. It well, took a while. It did. And I, I thank you for acknowledging that because in acknowledging that in me, you're really saying you acknowledge that whole movement of people because there's a lot of people I who, absolutely do. who are not said, fortunate to be sitting in You said further, the they were brave, they deserve yeah. to be remembered for their advocacy, and they started national conversation by screaming in the faces of the Reagans, the Bushes, the Clintons, anybody that would listen, really. Mm -hmm. And um, see, that, that to me is really, really important, and yeah. so I do acknowledge that. Yeah. And uh, with respect. Well, thank you. I appreciate it. However, <laughs> that advocacy mm -hmm. caused you to talk about Pulse. Pulso. Yeah. So, obviously, the, 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 the Pulse shooting was just tragic and shocking and horrific. And then the days coming that, that happened afterwards, there was so many emotions that we didn't know what to do. So a friend of mine, Roy Guzman, who's a brilliant writer, um, he was approached by a, pub a publisher to put together just a couple of short stories or uh, an anthology, and he didn't really have the time because he was in school. And I said, well, I would be happy to help. And we kind of just, through Twitter, however never met each other, worked on this project, and it ended up being uh, two years because a publisher moved out and then another one came in. So we had some uh, difficulties like selling the book to a publisher and keeping the vision the way we wanted it to be. Um, but we per we persisted. Were and we able to do that? Yeah, we w did. We did. Yeah, and so Damage Goods Press picked it up, and they said we'll we'll publish it the way you want, and all the proceeds will go to LGBTQ organizations, which was something that we just thought was incredible. Does Damage Goods um, specialize in LGBT? Yeah, they do LGBT and trans uh, trans um, poetry books publishing. So. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, we were just really grateful to them. Uh, well, I'm sure you were. Yeah. But d does the fact, and, and they did a wonderful mm -hmm. thing, there's no question yeah. about it. Does that limit your audience? I don't, I don't think so because um, intent, our first audience is for people of color, queer people of color, because right after Pulse there were so many voices kind of being heard and a lot mm -hmm. of them were pushing out the voices of the mar marginalized people who were like centered in this tragedy. Um, so it was really difficult for queer people of color to share their shock and their anger and their grief. And so that kind of was our first our first um, group of people that we were trying to read, reach. And then after that, it kind of um, expands to families of people who are LGBTQ and then friends and coworkers. And so it kind of ripples out that way. Um, but I think I think Damage Goods Press was was the right decision. Um, a, these days, a press is a press. You know, I mean, yeah. just getting the work out there is is, is a important. feat. Yeah. It, well, it is. Yeah. It is indeed. Um, talk about the the pulse uh, of the whole event yeah. just a little bit, because I'm sure there are people out there yeah. that are not quite sure what you're talking. about. Yeah. So on on June twelfth, uh, two thousand sixteen, uh, a man came walked into the Pulse nightclub in Orlando, Florida, and shot uh, and killed forty nine people and injured 53 more, and um, it was 
one of the largest mass shootings at the time. And this was a gay nightclub. And this was a gay nightclub. So that we need to make that yeah, it was clear. A, yeah, it was a gay mm-hmm. nightclub that was having Latin nights. So there was, there was not only were there gay, so gay there people were two there. two strikes in there. Yeah, room. so That's there right. were, yeah. you know, a lot yeah. of people of color yeah. there, yeah. Latino people, Afro-Latino people, um, African-Americans. Um, and then there were uh, just a lot of straight allies who were, in the, who were there as well. So when this tragedy happened, it just really cut across the entire swath of our Say community. Say again, how many people died? 49 people died, and, uh, and, and, and 53 were injured. injured. Um, and a lot of those who were injured are still facing a lot of... Bad. Re- yeah, a lot of repercussions of surgeries and um, just medical bills. So even to this day, they're still having and a lot of And some that issues. were neither of those things are still suffering. Oh, yeah, there's a lot the... of first responders who have trauma uh, it is a people. traumatic, yeah. h- horrible to see bodies and blood yeah. and everything all over. Well, yeah. And you think, why? Yeah. Why? Why? Yeah. Why does this happen? And who would do such a thing? And so part of the reason that we put the book together was to just, in those initial hours and days after the the tragedy, we put out the call, and every poem in there was written probably within a week or two of the 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 shooting. We really wanted to capture the raw, the rawness of the event, and um, I think we did a really good job at it. We had so many people submit work, and it was really difficult to, to pick. Um, but I really think everyone who even submitted work, because that really helped shape what the final form was. So, well, here's just a four lines that yeah. I think is kind of interesting. It says, "Some families can't get here." Mothers and fathers seeking humanitarian permissions who just want to mourn their babies. Erasure re-victimizes you. Talk about that, those three words, erasure yeah. re-victimizes you. Oh, gosh. So, and, you know, on the onset, you're already not seen by society, by coworkers, by uh, people around you. Even in your own community, sometimes people of color are marginalized because the, the uh, appearances that... Um, white gay men and women are the, I mean, we're talking like Will and Grace. I mean, everybody that are, that are on TV who are gay are basically um, Caucasian people. So it's really difficult when you're a person of color to try and find who you are in that, you know, in this already marginalized community. But then when you're expected, when you have a tragedy like this and people won't, igne- won't acknowledge your relationship to the person who's been injured or shot, whether you are a, par- a lifetime partner or a friend, or you're you're their family of choice because their their families in Puerto Rico or, or kicked them or their out, family or whatever, doesn't want them. or doesn't want them. There was a man who refused to accept the body of his of his son, and How so could you do that? that's your child, right? I mean, just the thought of that it's just it just undoes me, but um. So that's how erasure re-victimizes and uh, re-victimizes people over and over again, and not just the person who was shot or injured, killed, but everybody who loved them. You know, it's enough that that tragedy it isn't just put one person's in body. Yeah, in there. It's, oh, not. it's not. That's your family. You know. Yeah. Tell me, <coughs> how have things changed since ACT UP days? ACT UP. Well, fortunately, we have a lot of a lot of advancements in in medication and education. But AIDS is still a deadly disease. Um, it's on the verge of being manageable, but there's a lot of new cases that are rising in, mar- in marginalized communities, young black men, you know, young Latinos, uh, and young women but as how well. how have things changed in general, in general for, for oh, the LGBT? I think community. there's a lot more acceptance. I think people can, <laughs> depending on where you live, you, you can be a lot more open about your HIV status and be living your truth and like I have my doctor's appointment today or you know I'm doing a benefit for so and so in the midwest it's a little more tricky because we're there's still a lot of isolation we're not San Francisco or Miami or New York City where there's a history a long history of queer organizations that people have been used you know used to so it's I'm sure Do you it's find more, it more difficult or just as difficult I find it I find it easier than it was in the 80s um but I think because a lot of the community leaders we lost because of the disease, and a lot of them just got older and said, I can't do this anymore. I've got to think of my retirement. I've got to like put my life together after this this 15 year of the AIDS crisis. So a lot of them kind of faded into the background and no one kind of rose to pick up the... Is there some leadership now? I think there is some. I think there is now. There's a lot of interest among 
young queer people who want to know the history of activism about the about the AIDS crisis. Um, and so I think it's left to people like me who lived through it and who are still here to kind of talk about it and share the experience and, and do it in a way that doesn't romanticize it because it's... It was tough. It was tough. I mean, you can look at back, back at it and think, oh, it was activism, you were in the streets, and it was just a lot of drama and fun, but it was a lot of death and there was well, brutality. Well, it was a lot of danger. A lot of danger. Well, People were thrown out of families Do you think homes. organizations like PFLAG does a, a good job? I think they do a lot. I think they do a good job of... Um, Helping, helping people come parents. to terms with, mm -hmm. you know, with the situation with uh, the orientation, with people being trans. Uh, I think there still needs to be a lot of education on how to work, help people understand what HIV is and that it's no longer a death sentence like back in the, like that sign that I held up, it said 18 months from, you know, somebody who was diagnosed with HIV had 18 months to live. That was their lifespan. But one sexual orientation, I don't think any longer keeps them from being oh. uh, hired or getting you know, a job. No, 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 no. I th I but think it did at one time. It did at one time. And I think, you know, I find it really interesting that I think a lot of corporations adopted this diversity policy where would they include sexual orientation, and then they would move into city, into states like Kansas or Missouri, and they would say, this is our policy, and we need you to change your local district policy, or else we can't relocate our offices here. And once it became about money, about, oh, we're going to lose jobs from this employer if we don't do this, that became a motivator. But also, a lot of young people who grew up learning about HIV in school became you know, adults, and so it became easier for them to well, talk about Well, and helping it. younger people is a big... Yeah. Uh, a big part yes. of what you should be doing. Yeah. It is the activist fire still burn as bright. It still does. I mean, I can't, I can't hit every protest that I want to. <laughs> I mean, I'm like, oh, my back. Oh, I can't do it today. So I kind of well, have, like, <laughs> have, yes. like, yes. have to like think down the road. I get a Facebook invite to a march or something, and I think, okay, I have this to do, and I've got laundry, and I've got. But I have to realize that it's not me, meant for me to carry that load. There are a lot of younger people who need that activist experience. But they need you to show them the way. Exactly. And so that's why I try and show up and, and be present as much as I can without being the guy like, oh, we used to do it this way. Yeah. The way they do it is fine. You know, any, any way to get the point across that doesn't hurt anybody or doesn't hurt yourself is the way to well, do it. Well, here's a poem, and I'm not sure who the author was, but it, I like these three lines. It says, our job to keep the beat going, cause the pulse never stopped finding love in hopeless places. Mm -hmm. And isn't that what it's all about? That, that is what it's all about. I mean, through the tragedy of Pulse and through the horror of the AIDS crisis, there was always love because that's what got people through. That's what healed people to the best of our ability. That's what kept us together. Um, so that's what it was all about. And even in, even in the anger, there was love. Well, and he, he's capable of humor, too, because he wrote a piece called What It's Like to Be That Fat Person Sitting Next to You on the Play. <laughs> no. So there, there is humor mm, yeah. in Miguel M. Yeah. Morales. Yeah. Thank you for being with well, us. Thank you. I appreciate it so Keep much. up the good work. I'll try. The beat needs to keep going. <laughs> exactly. Thank you for being with us, and I hope that you enjoyed meeting our neighbor, Miguel M. Morales. Thanks, Miguel. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.